part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Iguodala to Curry, back to Iguodala, up for the layup. Oh, blocked by James. It's over. It's over. Cleveland is a city of champions once again. The Cavaliers are NBA champions. Hi, everyone. What's good? Thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of the Cavs on the Break NBA podcast right here on the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm your host, John Sable. Chase Smith sitting this one out tonight. But as always, we are always graced with the presence of NBA writer, Cavs writer, owner, operator of HoopsWire.com. Go there for your latest Cavs and NBA news. The one and only Sam Amico. Sam, what's good, my man? John, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm myself doing doing just fine. Um, ready for the Cavs to get at least one of their top three scorers back at some point here. Well, it's funny you say that because I'm currently on Hoops Wire and I see a title of a headline here. It says "Missing Three Stars Finally Catches Up with the Cavs." Well, it was bound to happen, and it did tonight. Cavs lose to the New Orleans Pelicans, one twenty three, one hundred four at home, and uh, looks like they may have lost another player from an injury tonight. Yeah, uh, you know, Sam Merrill, 27 points, career high against his hometown Utah Jazz, which was a great story. The game before that, 19 points, hit a huge three uh, off a pass from Donovan Mitchell the game before that, so really coming along nicely, and then all of a sudden you hear heading into this game against the Pelicans that he was questionable with a bad wrist, Donovan Mitchell, of course, and then and then Merrill played 12 minutes, went over four, couldn't go anymore uh, because of the wrist, which I guess he had suffered the injury uh, against the Jazz on a fall and, and was going to try to give it a go, but it didn't go very well against the Pelicans. So you're already missing, you know, Mitchell, uh, with who who's sick, and then obviously Garland and Mobley, and now all of a sudden you're losing the guy who who steps up in in Merrill uh in in their place and offers some scoring and you throw that in with the fact that you know second night of a back-to-back mm-hmm. uh against the new orleans team that's pretty decent on the road even though they didn't have zion williamson um still had you know cj mccollum and brandon ingram who are two of their three leading scorers and, and, and then trey murphy went nuts uh and he's capable of doing that for the pelicans so just you know it was bound to happen. They were bound to have one of these nights without Mobley, Garland, and Mitchell. Yeah, three game win streak snapped. I mean, the Pelicans team is a great road team. They're uh, seventeen and twelve on the year, and I mean, they're they're playing really good ball despite not having Zion. And hey, but you had two Northeast Ohio natives in that game tonight, or at least I should say, one of them played uh, in CJ McCollum. Um, he, he had a decent game. I mean, he was seven from fifteen from the floor, eighteen points. Uh, Larry Nance Jr. did not play. Uh, was it a rib injury? I think he's got a he got a, a he had a fractured rib at one point earlier this season. I guess he reaggravated it. So, yeah. yeah, did not did not see Larry Nance Jr. But I always say the New Orleans Pelicans have the two biggest Cleveland Browns fans on their <laughs> team in the entire NBA on the same team. What are the odds of that? What are the odds of that? Absolutely. You know, it's funny yeah. they both you know played in Portland once the Cavs got rid of yeah. um, Larry. Uh, yeah, and then CJ ended up coming down there too. So, um, you know, hey, we're not going to talk much a lot about this game because it's just a it's a it's a random game in December that the Cavs were bound to probably lose in a back to back. We're not going to put any stock into it. No Donovan Mitchell. I mean, you know, the, I think the one thing out of this game, the biggest thing for me is okay. Well, is Sam Merrill okay? I know he's not a a, a big player here, but he did have twenty seven points and the win the other night against Utah. Um, I think if there's one thing I would take away from this game was the depth. I mean, JB emptied the bench. Every player played tonight in the game. The yeah. Cavs didn't shoot very well. I mean, at times the Cavs were down by like 10 or 12 points, and you're like, wow, this game doesn't feel like it's 10 or 12. It felt like three, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, despite not having Mitchell losing um, by 19 points, four or five players were in double figure. So, hey, it's one of those nights. It, it, the one thing we talked about in the last pod after we recorded with, with Chase about the injuries to Darius Garland and Evan Mobley, you had a favorable schedule coming up here after that West Coast trip. They responded well against Atlanta. We That's what we looked at, Sam. They did it. And then they did it again uh, two days later against Houston and winning in overtime, and then they did it on this past Wednesday against the Jazz. So 
hey, you're what three and one since those injuries, right? You 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 had a four game home stand there, and you know, whenever I go on Mark Price podcast, which has been multiple times now, shockingly to everybody, but yeah, you're you're a recurring guest there. Anybody that hasn't checked out Mark's uh, podcast with yeah. Sam Amico as a special guest, do so. It's fun. Yeah, I, I've I've been on there more. I told him I'm I've been on here more than your brother, you know. So that really says a lot. I don't know. Maybe he just doesn't like friends. I don't know. But anyway, his whole point, my point of that is when I go on there, he talks about, you know, as a former NBA player, you, you always look at the long game and how is this benefiting us, you know, for the playoffs? Assuming we're going to get to the playoffs, how is this benefiting us? Well, you know, guys like Merrill, when he's healthy, are getting an opportunity to show Look, here's somebody who out there who you have to guard now if you're the opponent. This guy can spread the floor. He's going to hit threes. You've got another guy to worry about when Mitchell and Garland and Mobley are back. Merrill is, is a guy who could get regular minutes now because he spreads the floor, and that allows guys like Garland, Mobley, Mitchell, uh, Karis LeVert, whoever, to go one-on-one as opposed to, you know, what we saw from the Knicks last year, collapsing the defense all over uh, Mitchell and taking him out of the series for the most part. So, you know, this is this is where you get benefits. You, Dean Wade had a really nice game uh, against the Pelicans. He had a nice game last week. Uh, and if he can hit outside shots consistently, you know, again, now you have a 6'10 guy who's coming out. You have to go out around the three-point line and defend him so that when everybody's healthy, presumably that will happen someday. When everybody's healthy, then you then you've got you know two more guys along with the other guys who stretch the floor as you know we're assuming Max Struess does most nights. He had a terrible shooting night against New Orleans, but most nights he's going to be an outside threat. Uh, and you throw Merrill in there, and obviously Mitchell and Garland when healthy can hit those too. So um, I you know it's it's kind of the silver lining to all these injuries and. The, the bad news is because of the injuries, sometimes they're going to lose some games in the regular season in December. But hopefully in the long run, for their sake, for the Cavs' sake, uh, you know, look, eventually everybody healthy, they're going to be even deeper than they were going into uh, going into the start of the month when, it, when they had all five starters. Well, it's interesting you say that because that's going to parlay us into our next topic of the, the injuries in Donovan Mitchell and the ongoing swirling of rumors, which we'll get into shortly. But I, I do want to say, when you look at the, the rest of their, their schedule and, and who they've got coming up here, they're going to get tested again, not Saturday against Chicago necessarily. Um, I mean, the Bulls aren't, aren't playing. I mean, they've won three in a row tonight as we record this year on December 21st, right after the Cavs lost there uh, to the Pelicans. But they're going to get tested with Dallas on the road Wednesday and then Friday home against the Bucks. So you'll have two back-to-back games against two teams, um, you know, one in, in the Western Conference in, in Dallas, who's, you know, a top team there, a playoff team. You'll, you'll see Kyrie and, and uh, Luka Doncic there. Denver is what I think like the sixth seed right now, leading their division. I guess in the division the NBA doesn't make a difference, but just for context purposes. So you're going to get a even though you went three and one on this um, on this little homestand here, you're going to get tested right out of the gate again with a, a tough back to back games, uh, schedule wise, not day wise, because it's a Wednesday and a Friday game. Yeah, well, and I'll tell you what, Saturday too, they're at Chicago. The Bulls have been playing great since Zach Levine went down, frankly. And, <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, right. And, and and you know, they they won at Miami. Um they've they've just been playing extremely well lately. I think they I think they're like 8 and 3 since Zach Levine got hurt right in that neighborhood. So, you know, without you'd want to have Garland and Mobley for that game, uh especially in Chicago. So, yeah, it's three of the next four are going to be really tough. When you talk about, and I'm not sure who the fourth team in, is in there. I know, like you said, Chicago, Dallas, you get Milwaukee at home. And then you're at Toronto on New Year's Day. At Toronto, that's always a tough place to play. You know, I mean, especially when you don't have all your weapons, uh, you never know what's going to happen. 
what you hope for, what you need is at least Donovan Mitchell. You need him to feel better. I, I put that in my column tonight. Get well soon, Donovan, because this is going to be another tough, tough little stretch here coming up right around the holidays. So I'm I'm a little confused. The Cavs listed Donovan out because of illness. Was it right. not his shoulder? What did he hurt no. his shoulder? On he said his shoulder out. was fine. Okay, he ran into the stanchion. It didn't look fine, but no, after the game, I was there, and he he came out to the press conference and said, "Shoulder's fine. I'll be ready for Utah." This, of course, was Monday. Utah was Wednesday. Well, he got sick in there, and you know what? It, it, there is a lot of illness going around. Zion Williamson missed the game. Laurie Markinen uh, missed the Jazz win over the Pistons, uh, which at this point sends the Pistons to loss number 25 in a row. That was actually Uh, my next topic. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and I think it's going to be 27 because they've got Brooklyn on the road on Saturday. I really doubt they win that game, which would tie the record with the Cavs and the Sixers, 26 straight losses. And then, and then they get Brooklyn again a few nights, I think the night after Christmas at home. Um, I thought tonight was the night that they were going to win. I really did. Because they had Utah at home on the second night of a back-to-back, the Pist- or the Jazz, mm-hmm. and the Jazz didn't have to mark it. And no. I was just like, this this is the night for the Pistons to make it happen. And they they couldn't do it. So I, I think this losing streak is going to set the record and go well beyond what – the Cavs and Sixers at 26. I wouldn't be surprised if this hits 30 plus. They didn't, have, they didn't have uh Horton Tucker either. No. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just, uh, there was every reason for the Pistons to win it at home and, and they couldn't do it. And I think that the team is, you know, they've got to start from scratch. You got Kate Cunningham and, and everybody else can, you know, you could gut the roster if you want to. All right, let's let's talk about that real quick here. Um, <laughs> it, it the the Pistons like they started out the year, Sam, with an insane two oh, like two and zero start. They're now two and twenty six. They've lost um twenty five. No, they, they were two and one. Or, they were I'm two sorry, and one. two and yeah. one. Excuse me. Yeah. And then they lost yeah, the math right there. Duh. Then they went and lost. They've lost twenty five straight now. So. I mean, it, it's just their their schedule's been tough, but you're right that that roster is awful. And yeah, oh, but, th- right. If they if they lose another one, they will tie the record from the 2010 2011 Cavs, 13 14 Sixers. But the overall record is 28, held by the Sixers when the 20 uh, 2014 15 season ended and it started into the 15 16. So, yeah, they lost they lost two more in a row to start so the that- year. 28 would be the all-time record if you're counting more than one season. Right. Uh, so if they if the Pistons lose 29, they would set the overall record. And remember, they're at 25 right now. So you you just kind of laid out the schedule. They have a back-to-back, like you said, the 23rd with the Nets away, then back in Detroit against the Nets. Then they're at Boston on the 28th. So right then and there, those three games, if they lose, would tie the record. And then yeah. come up yeah. on Saturday, December thirtieth against the Raptors, would be the well. There's there's a Sixers team, I believe, in the nineteen seventies that finished nine and seventy three, which uh, the uh, the Pistons would certainly <laughs> might, might challenge that record. Um, I think it was it it would have been it would have been probably before obviously the Dr. J ABA merger somewhere in there um where they were where they were nine and seventy three. And I'm pretty sure You're right, nine seventy three. That was nineteen seventy three. They were nine and seventy three in nineteen seventy three. <laughs> what are the, yeah. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that's the all-time record. I don't think anybody's been worse than that. Actually, one other had... team, one other team was worse. Yes. Now, so percentage-wise, few... wasn't that during a shortened season? Maybe no. I'll, I got the list right here. So there were a few that were in partial uh, seasons, like the lockout or, or whatever. Right. That's what I meant. Like short. Right. Yeah. So the Pistons are on pace to shatter that record right now, but there was a team. Uh, twelve years ago was it? No, during the lockout. This 
Well, let me see here. Is that the lockout? Lockout, what year was that? 2010, 11, I believe. Yes, it was. Uh, 12, it would be. 2011, 12. Because the, the math. Rookie year. Yes. Yeah, so, so the math would add up here. It was the Charlotte Bobcats in 2012 went 7 and 59. Okay. So that so percentage you, was probably worse than 9 and 73. Somewhere in there would have been it would have been been really really lousy. You're having me do math here. Was that percentage of point one oh six? Promised me no math when I took this job, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so th there's. It's funny because you look at these all time, you know, worst records in the top ten. There are three teams that are currently in the top ten right now that are on pace to have one of the worst seasons ever. Pistons are number one. The Spurs and the Wizards are currently four and twenty-two. They would be ranked n tied for ninth worst of all time. Remember, we still we're we're not even halfway in the season yet, but still, it's pretty 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 bad. Could you imagine being a Washington Wizards fan? You know, I mean, listen it, to this. Listen to this. The Washington Wizards have not won fifty or more games. They haven't even hit fifty wins in a season. Since 1979, they have not hit 50 wins. I mean, so the best they've been is 49 and 34 over the last, what, 43 years, 44 years? Mm -hmm. 1979, they went to the finals that year, too. They lost to the Seattle Supersonics. Well, the Miracle but, Richfield year, uh, well, I wonder what that year what their record was that year i could look it up but uh probably 47 and something miracle richfield see if you remember what year was that i mean that would have been 76 wouldn't it 76 um they in 76 the they wizards were 48 and 34 well then they were the bullets bullets yeah yeah which i never understood the nickname change how was a stationary bullet sitting on a shelf any worse than practicing wizardry. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, right, right. You know. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you could you could say that a lot about random name changes in sports. We know that all too well here in Cleveland. Right. So right. No. uh but you're right. I'm looking at the Wizards all time records here. My goodness, even those years when Gilbert Arenas was in, in town with the with uh, uh Yeah, Ron they had Butler. some good teams with Arenas and Antoine Jameson. They were only they were a 500 team, Sam. 0405 was the best year they had in that stretch. 45 and 37. 0607 yeah. that year when uh they lost in the first round to um the Cavs. They were 41 and 41. Well, I'll tell you what. I know a guy who writes about the Wizards and has been for longer than I've been doing the Cavs and he covers them relentlessly. He yeah. is he is writing the similar, you know, the equivalent of of dribbles after every game. He's writing pregame and post game and interviews. I mean, if you and I, I, I forgive me, I can't remember his name right now, but I just I know him when I see him on Twitter because he's got the Wizards logo as his profile picture. Yeah. Um I I I I I can't imagine doing that where, you know, at least with as far as we go in Cleveland, LeBron came back and now there's a competitive team again and, you know, all that. But for them, yeah, it just keeps getting worse. It's basketball Siberia, man. It really is. Really I is. mean, the, the, there have been some locations I've joked about on the podcast before of, of locations in the league where, where it's basketball Siberia. I've joked that it was Minnesota and, and Sacramento, and all of a sudden those two franchises are actually yeah. doing really well. Yeah. I think Charlotte would be in that category. Washington sure. is clearly in that category. I would say Phoenix used to be in that category for uh, some time there after that they're now, but now they're competitive and good. Um, so yeah, crazy times, I, man. Only one team, one team in the NBA has not played on Christmas Day. The Wizards. No, they played. When they back when they were the bullets. Oh man, you're driving some trivia on me. This here. is this is yeah. I want to know if any of our listeners know this without googling it. Um. Uh. It's got to be a newer team. Well, I guess they're kind of newer. Yeah, I mean, they're not a Western they're, Conference they're, team. Nope. Okay. Hornets. You got it. Yes. The Hornets. 
And you can see I'm right here. I'm not looking it up. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. No, well, I remember I was flipping through the other night and there was like a Christmas Day game from 1978 or something on there. Yeah. It was the Cavaliers from 1978. We're playing. It might have even been earlier because they were playing on Christmas, the Buffalo Braves. Wow. Who now, of course, are the Los Angeles Clippers. But yeah. So even the Buffalo Braves have been on Christmas Day, whereas the Charlotte Hornets are the only team. Memphis last year was the first year that the Grizzlies had played on Christmas. Yeah, I do remember that. Good yeah. point. So hmm. anyway, there's there's our Wizards, Pistons, and Hornets talk for the for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to get back in the Cavaliers talk because we want to talk about the latest on this Donovan Mitchell rumor that continue to kind of be the talk of NBA circles ever since those injuries of Darius Garland and Evan Mobley went down last week. And it's a topic that everyone's been really chatting about all week long. Sam and I are going to get into it very latest, what he knows, what he's hearing coming up. You can't see us. Sam and I are in Zoom at, at both of our houses, and you can't see the shirts that we're wearing. Um, we are wearing brand spanking new homage T-shirts. If you are uh, from the Cleveland area, Columbus, you all know this uh, company that is helping us out here. Boy, they have designed quite the array of uh, NBA gear, Cavs gear, Major League Baseball, NFL official licenses. Sam, what homage shirt are you wearing of the Cavaliers at the moment? What is that? Is that is that your boy Austin? Austin, uh, I'm so old school. It's Austin Carr as a player, you mm. know. And uh, I, I'm sad to say that I don't remember getting to. Uh, I don't remember Austin as a player, uh, uh, just as a fan favorite, as a you know, uh, a, a color analyst and in game analyst. Um, but I have watched him on YouTube and all that. So, yeah, I, when I saw this shirt, I was just like, I have to have it. It's it's AC, AC, not only as a player in the old school Cavs uniform, but of course, the AC I know and love always smiling about something. So, um, yeah, it's, it's perfect for me. I'm an, I, I love, you know, NBA history and old school stuff and the fact that I uh, it would consider it uh, Austin Carr friend. I just very much look forward to wearing this T-shirt in front of him and uh, having him tell me how great I am because I'm wearing it probably for no other reason. But at least he'll tell me I'm great. AC's always smiling, and if I want to be around him when he you wear that shirt in front of him because his his grin's gonna get even bigger and bigger. I think we uh, should meet at center court in front of at halftime or something in front of in front of fans that would be my goal you know what i'll i'll wear my homage shirt that i got of uh, the nba Cavs nba jam shirt of had the stats of mark price and brad doherty that's the one i have yeah Um, they were nice enough to send me another one it was a gray with the uh old school austin Carr era Cavs wine and gold script on it i know um chase was rocking a uh, uh wine hoodie with the new Cavs font on the front of it uh, just some awesome products there. Perfect gift this holiday season. So uh, if you can, go on our show notes here, um, wherever you're listening to your podcast, on Spotify, on Apple, or um, any other location there, wherever you're seeing our description of our show, scroll on down. You'll see the link. You can buy your Cavs gear, Browns, Guardians, Ohio State, Mac, you name it. Great quality product right there on the Homage website. Go on our show notes. Click that link there and uh, enjoy yourself a nice, warm, cozy hoodie. Anything you want makes a great holiday gift. What's up, everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tigers Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season, hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs got to eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange, Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. What's up, everyone? Chase Smith here, host of the Chase Smith podcast, and my podcast reflects who I am. 
my hobbies, my interests, my passions, my curiosities, my careers, my questions, and my family. I'll spend time talking about all types of sports, movies, TV shows, trending news stories, and other cultural events, and even faith. This is who I am, and I hope I can get to know you as well. Join me on the Chase Smith Podcast, and let's have some thought-provoking conversations only on the Press Play Podcast Network. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history? Then you found the perfect podcast. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. And we're back here at Cavs on the Break NBA podcast right here on the Press Play Podcast Network. John Sable alongside Sam Amico. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to podcasts. We uh, appreciate you guys listening in, staying with us here. Now we're getting into a topic here that has been on the hot button issue, Sam, with the Cavs, fans, NBA circles, um, about Donovan Mitchell. There there was an, an assumption I guess you could say an educated assumption, if that even makes sense, that the Cavs should trade Donovan Mitchell. We've kind of talked a little bit about it. Chase has brought this up many times too. Um, with the injuries, it's a they're, they're just going to cave in and quit on the season, which the Cavs are not doing. With Donovan Mitchell, um, with his with his status with the team with Evan Mobley and Darius Garland, um, teams have called the Cavs. Right uh, there, there's yeah. intrigue there. What do you know? What are you hearing? I, I don't think they do anything, but what say you and what are you what are you hearing? No, I don't think they'll do anything either. I don't I put it this way. When Garland and Mobley went out, um I believe and, and others have reported that that other teams started calling about Mitchell because they thought, well, maybe there's you know, maybe there's something there where the Cavs are just gonna mail it in because they're gonna be missing Garland for you know theoretically four to six weeks and Mobley for six to eight weeks. Uh, so maybe they're, I, I guess if you're other teams, you're calling to say, Hey, what are you guys thinking? Um, and, and the Cavs thinking is basically, look, we just have too much belief right now in this team when healthy to do anything, but try to prepare for, for a playoff run. Um, and the, the, there's there's no sense in the organization. Anybody who's called has been shot down quickly. Let's put it that way. That much I do know. Um, there hasn't, you know, I don't. Nobody's made any kind of offer for Donovan Mitchell. It's been more like, what what do you guys, you know, might you be sellers at the trade deadline or before the trade deadline? In which the Cavs have said no, you know. But other GMs have to call and find out. So, uh, and, and they've been thwarted. You know, all those. Any of those questions have been rebuffed. Um, so, you know, there's there's really no – and there's no need to trade. We talked about this on the last podcast. There's no need to trade Donovan Mitchell right now. Uh, the Cavs are right in the mix for the playoffs, you know, it, despite all the injuries, which have been, uh, you know, right up there with the Browns when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to missing your top guys. So, um the good news for the Cavs is those guys are due back. Mitchell, obviously, uh, knock on wood, is just sick. He's going to be I'm, – I'm assuming he'll be ready to go Saturday in Chicago. So there's there's just no reason for them to trade him. He's not asking for a trade or requesting a trade or have one eye. As far as we know, he has – you know, one guy said, oh, I know I know a guy who knows Mitchell who, you know, a reader said this on, uh, on Twitter. So that, you know, I, I know a guy who knows Mitchell – thinks he's gone and i'm like well we talk to mitchell all the time and he never ever gives that indication um i really do think so much of what happens with mitchell is going to be based on what happens this season you know if they if they can if they can put together if the Cavs can put together a playoff run um or or or, you know i I think get to the second round then then 
you know, and, and continue to show promise, then, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any sense that he's out of here at the first opportunity, which wouldn't be until the end of next season would be his first opportunity. Um, but, you know, this, this summer, this, this off season would be the season to start thinking, okay, we need to get him signed to an extension or, if we don't, then yeah, we've got some things to think about. So, uh, but but as far as this year, no, I, I don't I don't foresee them doing anything. I think they're going to stand pat and see how far they can go. That's that's why this team was built. That's why they traded for him to give it. They knew we had a few years on his contract, and they wanted to give it some time. And they've only had one year with Mitchell, you know, one season. So, you know, and and, and John, as you saw. I'm sure I, I sent you the link on the podcast or on the website was uh, Adrian Wojnarowski. Somebody asked him, you know, uh, on on threads, which is the alternative to Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. <laughs> somebody asked him on there, you know, can the Pelicans, can the New Orleans Pelicans get in on the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes? And Wojnarowski's answer was, there is no Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes. The Cavs aren't looking to trade him. So I think that, that, you know, somebody who's an absolute authority like Woj, if he if he knows that and sees that, then I think he's speaking truth. I think the timing of these injuries are are key here because you have so much of the season left. Still got fifty some games remaining. By the time Mobley and Garland come back, you're looking after the new year, you're looking in closer to the trade deadline, actually after the trade deadline potentially, more than likely. So, you know, the Cavs would be wise, in my opinion, just to wait and to see where they are. If they can, you know, be a, a late pick and get into the play-in tournament at worst-case scenario, or I guess it would be worst-case. Worst-case means they'd not get in the playoffs. But if they're in the playoffs, worst-case would be be a play-in tournament game. And you have those guys back, and, and you and you could take a run at it. I mean, there's just still too much talent on this team, Sam, that – Kobe Altman and company would just quote unquote give up and just trade Donovan Mitchell away now when you just said two guys are going to come back this season. Now, if you want to play the old hypothetical game, which we know you and I and Chase love to play when he's on here, is what if these injuries were season ending? Would that alter Altman's change or his, his approach? I think it could. Mm-hmm. I think it would change Mitchell's because I, I, t- I 100% agree with you. Donovan is is in a situation where he wants to see where this team is going to go and how far they go this year. He's 100% bought in. His there's no any feet out the door with him. He wants and is invested in this team. He was like he said that to us um at media day when we all talked with him. And remember I asked him point blank about his contract and everything and about his extension. I mean, yeah, he's not going to sign the extension because he's going to get more money if he does if, if he waits to sign it anyways. That's, it's not necessarily have anything to do with the Cavs. Um, but there's just a lot of moving parts here. The Cavs hold all the leverage here, and they're not going to panic. Kobe Altman is not that kind of guy, and I said that before, where he's knee-jerk reaction, and he's just going to make a move like that. Here's the thing. If you're going to trade Donovan Mitchell, you better get draft picks back. That's the key. You would have to do that. And whether that happens at the deadline, which we both agree will not happen, or if it happens in the summer, which is potentially more likely, uh, that's the kind of return you're going to look at as well as established players. Yeah, I think they would get, a, a, you know, obviously they'd get a pretty decent haul for a guy who's an all-star starter. Um, but I, just I mean, that's think, a podcast for a different day, but we're just right, for the sake of right. talking. Yeah, and, and they would, you know, they would. And if you look at this team, the the trajectory before they traded Markinen and Colin Sexton, they were, they were, they still had an upward trajectory promising team and i feel like you know with mobley and garland and and strews and jared allen they would still have a very promising team look this year if everybody stays healthy let's just talk about this year if everybody stays healthy or relatively healthy boston milwaukee and philadelphia those are the top three teams in the east right now that's the way it's yep. going to stay mm-hmm. but, that's not changing no those three are going to stay at the top but and the Cavs finished fourth last year. They right now the Cavs are sixteen and thirteen. Okay, at this at this recording, the Orlando Magic are in fourth, and they're sixteen and eleven. So the Cavs have as many wins as the Magic, 
They just happen to play two more games. Mm-hmm. And then you have the Knicks who are in fifth. Also, you know, 16-11, I think they're in fifth because of conference record or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the Heat are 16-12, and 12 and they're in sixth. The Cavs are seventh, 16-13. And I think the Pacers, the Nets, and the Hawks are all going to finish below the Cavs anyway. The Pacers have cooled off, too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, right. I mean... You know, I I suspect Orlando's not going to finish fourth. Yeah, I was just going to say that too. As nice of a run as they're having, it's going to be between the Cavs and the Knicks and the Heat. And I think it's going to be that way all year. And the Cavs get their players back. You never know what could happen. You really don't. And I think that that's the way the Cavs are looking at it as opposed to, wow, we have to give up on the season because we're never going to catch the Orlando Magic at four. I don't think that. I, I I, I know that the Cavs aren't thinking that. They're thinking, you know, we can get into the playoffs in a good spot, probably with home court advantage in the first round again. And if we get the Knicks or the Heat, you know, or or say the Pacers get their act together and climb back up, which I don't suspect, I I, I, I really think that the Cavs are – and it's not even me thinking. You just look at their record right now, and they're tied in wins with the team that's currently in fourth. I think they have a – an excellent shot uh, to get that fourth spot when once they end up getting healthy. All they have to do now is stay the course. They don't have to be any better than they are right now until Mobley and Garland get back. And then, and then when it means the most, you got to be healthy and, and be playing your best basketball. But that's got you know, you know, John. That's March, you know, and that's a few months away. So I think they're in a good spot. And there's yeah, there's there's no reason to trade Mitchell when he's not asking. For that and he's under contract. Do you want to hear something that's gonna blow your mind? I just looked this just looked this up. And I, I agree with everything you're saying too. You mentioned like you're you're going through the whole like standings and, and teams that could be there or couldn't be there. And again, I agree with you. Uh top three isn't isn't gonna change. Cavs are gonna finish it, the at best four through six. The Cavs finished the season last year with a 51 and 31 record, 20 games above 500 with the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference. Cavs just lost tonight to go to 16 and 13. They have 29 games. Without looking it up, and I can tell if you're looking it up here as we record this on Zoom. Sam, do you know what the Cavs record was last year when they were at uh win number 29? Or game, excuse me, game number 29? 18 and 11. Man, you are on the money. How did you didn't hesitate? Yeah. No, I thought I I would have thought, but I mean, it wasn't much better. It wasn't much better. People forget too. The Cavs last season. Well, I mean, the people don't necessarily forget, but I mean, the Cavs last year came out firing. They won eight and eight and one, and then they kind of sputtered. They're only two games better last year than they are this year at this point. And yes, I know Garland and Mobley are out, and they've had injuries throughout the entire season, including those two smaller injuries before their knee and jaw, but Donovan has been hurt. He's hurt now. Um, I, mean, I, I think, yeah, John, not to cut you off, but I think that, that they're deeper this year than they were last oh, year. Do, then, exactly. Yeah. Because you have Max Struess and George Niang in there that, and Craig Porter. Um, are, are those three guys are given the max amount of depth more so uh, Niang and Struess, but, and they're more weapons too. I mean, yeah, well, you have Levert and Okoro, who obviously have been were, were here last year, but they've been I hurt. Mean, those guys, those guys have been playing, playing just fine. They and, and they know their coach. It's not like they have a new coach and a new system and a new personality to to deal with them. Who's managing them? Yeah. Um. So I just think I, I know people are like wanting me to be more panicked because you know when 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 they were. Right after LeBron left, I was probably maybe even too hard on them. But now I just I don't see a reason to be. They're they're right in the mix of as we just said, right in the mix of that four through six range where they'll avoid the play in tournament and and uh they don't even have all their weapons. So I, I think they're I think they're in a good spot right now. Now, granted, there's you know, there's there's these four games coming up that we talked about this tough stretch that's you know going to be very tough but then they've got six straight home games 
you know, from, from January 3rd to January 17th, they play six in a row at home, which is almost unheard of in the NBA. Not, yeah, but back in the day, you had those. Back in the day, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Or, or, so those, yeah. Or early, uh, those early 90s or whatever. Yes. I remember, like, looking at the old schedule pocketbook, you know, schedule that you yeah. see looking at them, you know. And you would have a lot of these long homestands, long road trips that were like eight, nine games or something like that out west. Yeah. Now, now that I think of the CBA kind of eliminated that, now you have like kind of like too many West Coast trips. But you're right. You don't get six home games like that in a row. Not, not, not very often. Yeah, I do remember that. I do remember that they, you used to go when you went to the West Coast, you'd play like every everybody on the West Coast. And then you go back and do a Southern trip. Yeah, you know, for like the Dallas's, Houston's, the Spurs, uh, um, and some of the Phoenix, some of those other teams out there. And, and you, you always, and you you always did, you always did Utah and Denver back to back. Yes, and then you, you yes. always hit the Lakers and Clippers, and then you then if you went to the Sacramento, you knew you were going to hit Portland and Seattle, mm-hmm. and then if you're going to do the Texas Triangle, you're going to fit yeah. Phoenix. Yeah, there was in. no, there you was know? no, we're going to play. You know, we're going to fly down for a quick game against Houston, then we're coming back home. No, it's it's it used to be uh, a lot more daunting, and of course that they would they would not fly on their own jets. They, I remember one time when I was in college, I was in the airport, and in come you know Mark Price and Brad Doherty and Larry Nance and the rest of the Cavs just come walking in because they're flying flying a regular flight like the rest of us. So yeah, things have things have really changed, but. It, Going back to modern day, it's nice that they're getting these six games in a row at home, especially after a tough trip. And you know what? We talked about this on a few weeks ago podcast to start the year. The Cavs had a tough West Coast road trip to start the year, and then it's kind of bookended because they're going to have a tough West Coast road trip to end the year, and it's going to be that could decide their seeding. I'm just looking at it real quick here. End of eight, or beginning of April, at the end of the season. Denver, Utah, Phoenix, Lakers, Clippers. So it's kind of like that old school trip we were just talking yeah. about. You're hitting Denver yeah. and you hit Philly, or excuse me, Denver and Utah. Philly's a home game before that. And then you're going to both hit the LA teams, and Phoenix is going to get sprinkled in there. I, did, I I remembered those old trips like that. And I just, after I said it and you're talking, I went to look and I'm like, sure enough, that old school trip is right there. But yeah, uh, and that's, that's going to be tough because the West is going to be really tight to the end. So, you know, Phoenix is going to be playing their guys and the Lakers and the Clippers. I mean, those those teams all have uh, – out of all the teams you just named, the Lakers are going to be the easy game on the trip, which uh, obviously going against LeBron, yep. you know. But anyway, that's that's way down the road and uh, a lot, lot this certainly could and certainly will happen between now and then. Yeah, you got to beat up on these Eastern uh, Conference teams in the middle of the season and sprinkling some bad Westerns there. And you'll have some tough games here or there. It's the NBA. You know, that's not a cakewalk. But uh, the good thing is you do have a lot of your um, – you have a lot, of home ga- a lot more home games coming up here because the Cavs have played uh, quite a bit of on, on the road, even though despite have that be- that being the case, they have not played well at home this season, which is a whole nother thing, which – JB can't figure out. He's been asked that question, and and he's not quite sure. And I don't think anybody really is understanding why the Cavs have struggled so much at home. It seems uh, like when their injuries are at their absolute worst is when they have a home game. That's yeah. that's what I can gather from that is that every their home schedule has not been kind in the sense that they've they've played a lot of very good teams at home. They have had a lot of injuries when at home. And they've played yeah. a lot like tonight where, you know, they've had two home games in a row, back-to-back nights, and the other team is actually doesn't have a game. Like the Pelicans did not have a game last night. So I think that good the, point. even though they're, they're, you know, the games are at home, they've, they've had a lot working against them where they, they've been pretty good on the road when, when healthy. Yeah. Yep. Good point. I didn't think about that way, but yeah, you're right. It's just a bad luck in the way the schedule has lined up. Yeah. And, and scenarios and variables that are out of their controls, the injuries, and then versus who's coming in and what they're dealing with. So, all right, well, that'll wrap it up here, Sam. Um, a lot to look forward to for the Cavaliers, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how they can go forth here in the next few days, wrap up the month of December with Chicago, Dallas, and Milwaukee in the first of the year, beginning at Toronto on January 1st. And uh, from then, they're going to have some t- uh, some games in there to 
try to build on whatever they can with the chemistry they have with the guys they have. So um, any closing closing thoughts here as we approach the new year and the holiday season? Yes, I have a very important closing thought. I hope that somehow they refine the heating system at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse because it's freezing in there. We literally, and I, I tweeted something out about it, and I said, you know, uh, I, I, why is it always freezing in Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse? But then I said, you know, I put a disclaimer in there. Maybe it's just me because I'm old and therefore, <laughs> you know, always cold. But no, some woman tweeted back at me and said, no, you're absolutely right. It's freezing in here. And I'm not the only one. So I don't know why that is. Hmm. All of a sudden, it got really cold in there. And, and uh, you know, I hope that it gets fixed before those six straight home games because odds are I'll beat all six of them. And uh, I don't well, want to have to. Put out another layer. People, people are layering. People are, you know, I get that when you're going out, you know, to watch the Browns or the Indians or the, excuse me, the Guardians in in April. But when you're playing an indoor sport, it's not, you know, unless it's hockey, I guess. Well, there is the hockey rink is underneath the floor. That could be it. I don't know. I yeah, just, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to put that out there because you asked me for any closing thoughts. And yeah, sure Sam, that I think you might be getting old. Is regretting that you asked <laughs> me that, but um, anyway, deep that's thoughts it. with Sam Amico. <laughs> <laughs> Eat up the arena, baby. There you go. All right. Well, you can read Sam Amico at hoopswire dot com. Sam, it's Merry been real, man. We'll chat again. Merry somebody. Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. I hope Santa is good to you. I hope he brings you a sweater for those indoor games. Oh, uh, you and me both. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good holiday. Congratulations, Cleveland. Your decades-long wait is finally over. The Cavaliers are NBA champions.